Good morning, afternoon, evening, very, very early morning for our friends out west. Welcome, welcome to Rayfest, our online festival celebrating women of spirit. Thank you so much for joining us from right around the world. We are so grateful. I'm your host, Saima Dyer, and together with Fatima Ashraf, we are the co-creators of Ray of God. Ray seeks to share feminine spiritual wisdom to help realize God in all ways and to align with justice, truth and beauty. The energetic state of the feminine is our guiding principle and holds our intention. And we believe that all genders hold the feminine and the masculine within themselves. And while we are women led and women centered, we welcome and encourage all genders to join us in helping to create safer, more inclusive spaces. So Ray does not seek to present a voice of expertise. We see ourselves as travelers along the way and learning with each step. And our ideas are constantly evolving and we are grateful to have you joining us on this journey to deeper consciousness. The aim of this year's festival is to rise, vocalize and deepen. And our contributors will be speaking to the broad theme of her voice. When we challenge the generational silencing of women and control of our bodies, how can we begin to heal our relationship with self, other and the divine? And we're blessed to be welcoming, as always over the course of this weekend, a diverse array of intergenerational, interspiritual contributors religious leaders, spiritual teachers, activists, academics, creatives, all and so much more. And um, as, as you know, this weekend is leading into All Hallows Eve or All Saints Eve and Samhain, the midway point between the autumn equinox and the winter solstice. And it's a time to honour the saints. And we hold in our awareness that there will be many around the world in ceremony and prayer at the same time that our festival is unfolding. So in this first heart to heart conversation of the weekend, um, we're asking our contributors to speak to the theme and we welcome your questions to be submitted through the chat function. If you can send them to myself, feel free to ask whatever questions come to your heart. Just being mindful that our contributors are also on a journey like each of us and deserve our love and respect and being willing to share from their hearts in such an open forum. So I'm delighted to introduce our spiriting Shiros for this first session. We have Leila Yagiela, a cultural anthropologist and scholar of religion who's worked on orthodoxy and heterodoxy in Islam and gender and sexuality in Muslim societies. Leila has been with us. Um, this is her third Ray Fest, third with us, uh, third altogether. And I'm delighted to be welcoming her back and we're um, looking forward to speaking about her, her new book, among the eunuchs, a Muslim transgender journey, which was published by, by Hearst London last year. And joining Layla, we've also got returning again for the third time, she's been with us from the start, Reverend Canon Dr. Rachel Mann. She's a priest, poet, scholar, and broadcaster. She has written many books, including a debut novel, The Gospel of Eve, and the latest book of theology, Spectres of God. And so really delighted to be exploring those with her again. So I'm going to just open up um, into our theme and I really want it to be a conversation. So anything that arises between between us all, you know, hopefully it will just flow. So as I said, our theme this year is her voice with an invitation to rise, vocalize and deepen. And the first kind of um, opening into this for both of you and uh, maybe Rachel could go first is how does the feminine voice rise up in you? And what does that mean to you? What is your relationship to your voice? Gosh, thank you. Thank you, Soma. And it's wonderful to be back. This could go in so many different directions. I think I need to acknowledge that as a trans woman of a very particular vintage, dare I say, a trans woman who transitioned a long, long time ago in a, in a galaxy far away when there really weren't very many 
interesting, diverse or rich narratives for trans people, uh, non-binary people were just absolutely erased that I approach this question of feminine voice of, of, of female voice of women's voice, whatever voice we want to talk about with all of the traces of someone who, and I, you know, I've, I've always been open about this acknowledges that I was educated into a particular kind of power voice a power voice that was shaped around masculinity, was shaped around whiteness, um, uh, was shaped around me traveling from being working class into the middle class academic world. And this voice is a voice of, of control and of division and of analysis. Um, I spent the first 10 years of my academic life and career in philosophy. It was it, and, and in, in Anglo-American philosophy where everything got broken down and was taken apart and examined. And of course, that's something women and men can do and everyone else in between can do. But there's a particular kind of dynamic there. And so in one sense, as I transitioned, I think I experienced a stepping into silence and to silencing into discovering for me how um, secondary women's voices are in place like the UK, stepping into a place of danger, stepping into a place of exclusion and mockery and, and violence and and me also wanting to learn that i can't unlearn that academic voice that i will always carry that trace of of power and authority i think with me but then learning to inhabit some new ways of articulation and talking and being me as a woman who was still coded somewhat differently as a, as a trans woman, but also discovering solidarity with the silencing that so many women have experienced and continue ex to experience in patriarchal religious cultures. And that rising up, sorry, I'm gonna shut up in a minute because I can ramble on forever. You've all, those of you back from a previ previous Ray Fest, well, now I can talk for, well, not just for England, but for an entire universe, uh, I just can't shut up, is, is discovering that finding a voice, finding my voice, finding my voice in solidarity and in the company of those who have been serially excluded and often exploited, often from birth, required me turning down the dimmer switch on all sorts of things but then finding a fresh articulation in the living god discovering god's profound femininity god's profound queerness god's profound disruption and strangeness and it's no surprise to me that i became a poet and a, and a creative and that's not because poetry is somehow female or feminine although these days most people in the uk who write poetry are women it has historically been seen as the ultimate male form of expression but somehow as i stepped into unknowingness and a letting go of of sureties and certainties new kinds of words and language became possible in the womb of silence so there's just something extraordinary about discovering that just fecundity at the heart of 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 that which has never been given center stage and prioritized womanhood femininity queerness otherness I'm going to shut up there. 
um because maybe we'll circle around and unpack that a bit more as we go along thank you rachel as always what a wonderful place to start i've already got so many questions just bouncing from there but i know they're going to connect with what layla's got to say layla um please take it away <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here again. I'm so, so happy to be here. Um, also, thank you very much for, you know, rearranging the schedule a little bit. I, I don't know what happens. Each year I try to keep this time slot free for you. And each time something happens and some rearrangement is, is necessary. I'm so sorry for this, but I'm also... I'm, I'm, I'm happy that through this, I now have this occasion to be on this panel with Rachel. And it's so, so wonderful that we've both been a part of Rayfest for three years now. But this is the first time I think that we've, we, we are both on, on one panel and we can exchange our experiences of um, what it means to be a, a, a trans woman with a spiritual vision, um, which I rarely have in occasion to do actually i speak a lot on on muslim issues i speak in all kinds of contexts but this this kind of exchange actually doesn't happen that often it's wonderful that it takes place here now um yeah my relationship to voice um i'm i'm when i'm thinking of voice i'm first of all thinking very very literally of my voice my my physical voice because i do have a bit of a as as a trans woman in particular i have a fragile relationship with that voice. I don't, I, I've struggled with it for most of my life, actually. I'm, um, I don't know how old you are, Rachel, but uh, I, I also do feel that I come from another galaxy because I, I uh, the, the world that I grew up in and the world that I transitioned in was also very, very different from the world that we see now and the discourses that we have now around gender and sexuality. Um, I'm a child of the 80s. I'm, uh, I was born in 1980. Um, I transitioned 20 years ago. And uh, during both times, the, the yeah, the, I, I was about to say the public conversation around trans issues was quite different, but I, I actually have to say there was no public conversation. There, there were a few, you know, appearances of trans people on TV, maybe as freaks, but that was it. And there was not much public awareness of what it means to be transgender at all, um, especially in Germany. Um, and uh, as uh, I, I, I do remember that as a child and as a teenager, I already became very conscious of my voice and very conscious of my way of speaking because that was often a reason for others to single me out because the way I spoke was too feminine for a boy, a person assigned male at birth. Um, my voice or the way I, I spoke was often the reason for being called a fag or a sissy, uh, for being attacked. Um, and uh, then, very strangely, after transitioning, the reverse happened, that suddenly I was afraid or I became afraid that my voice would easily single me out as, as, as not being a, a cisgender woman, as, as outing me as trans, because it's not a very typical uh, woman's voice. And, and sometimes people react very positively to my voice. I actually get a lot of positive reactions and people do not immediately realize uh, that it's a trans woman's voice and just say, oh, you have such a wonderful voice. Um, but all, quite often it is the marker that singles me out and it is the, the reason why people clock me as trans and realize that I'm trans and that, that, that I, I'm very aware of that and I move through the world with that kind of awareness. And I've, I've told uh, Saima and Fatima uh, before that there, there have been so many situations in my life where I did not dare to speak because I was, I was afraid that if I, if I spoke, my voice would out me and, and would make me recognizable as a trans person. I, I remember one particular occasion that happened, I think one year ago or two years ago. So not, not long ago, actually, when I was, uh, 
I was actually going to my partner's place and he lives a little bit, he doesn't live far away, but there's this, a short train journey. And uh, there was a group of, and the train was empty, was very empty. Um, the, but suddenly a group of, 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 of drunk men entered the train compartment. Um, and when something like that happens, I immediately, you know, I tense up and I immediately have this thing running through my mind. Oh my God, I hope they don't see me and they don't realize I'm trans because then there could be insults, there could be attacks, there could be all kinds of stuff going on. And, um, and sure enough, after a while, one of these drunk guys said to his pals, oh, do you think that's a man or a woman? And I was, you know, tensing up even more. And I was, um, I was messaging a friend about this because I was, I was feeling so alone in that situation and so vulnerable. And um, I, uh, I needed somebody to talk to. So I messaged and said, look, this is going on. I'm feeling a bit vulnerable. Uh, I hope nothing bad happens, but if you know where I am and, and so on and so on. Um, and she said, she, she replied, shall I call you? And I said, no, under no circumstances call me because if you call me, then I will have to, to use my voice and then they will know for sure that I'm trans and I'm really afraid of that. So the, these kind of things happen quite often to me and that has made me not, you know, it, 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 it gave me a very complicated relationship with my voice. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I'm also, because of it, I'm thinking differently also about a lot of, you know, figurative speech that we're using here in this circle. You're using, you use the phrase to deepen our voices. <laughs> and my immediate thought was, no, I'm sorry. As a trans woman, I do not want to deepen my voice. That is a very, very clear thing. You know, I don't want to do that. Um, yeah, but. On the other hand, I am also a very public person. I, I sit on panels quite often. I give workshop talks. I wrote a book, as you mentioned. Um, I, I've been on TV a couple of times on, on, on German speaking TV. And um, it's a very strange thing to then, even though you have this relationship with your voice that is so fragile and broken, you, you still, have to come to that point where you where you have to feel comfortable of of being a public speaker and uh, i have that within me as well but it hasn't erased the other issue both you know both sides exist within me they are sometimes there at the same time so I have this person, personality that loves to speak out, that's very glad to speak out, that's very outspoken. I think a lot of people would describe me as outspoken. And at the same time, I'm also constantly afraid of my own voice. I, I think that's, yeah, that's the main point of what I, I would like to share with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leila, for sharing such a personal experience just really appreciate you doing that and and I, and I you know it's always like you say you know words can have such different meanings you know and when Fatima and I are sitting with a the theme and we're trying to see what comes up for us we always try to keep it as broad as possible because we don't want to define anything because we want to see what comes up you know through our through our contributors and, and so what you say about deeper you know I want to come back to it but I think that's that's yeah that's very key. And I, and I picked up the both of you, you know, Rachel and Leila, you know, Rachel, you talked about this stepping into silence and this womb of silence, which stepping into silence can sometimes be quite um, meaningful and conscious, but it could also be this, you've been forced into the stepping into silence, which Leila's brought up about not daring to speak. Um, and this connects to obviously the, the you know, the, the second kind of um, point that we had about vocalize. And you've already talked about how you're vocalizing your truth, how you're, you know, um, sharing your stories. Um, Rachel, you know, you're you're a reverend, but I also feel like Layla, like both of what you're doing is it's ministry, you know, in that you're sharing your experience, you're doing it as as spiritual women, 
you're connected to your faith and this is what you're vocalizing and just connected to what we've already spoken about you know if you could speak more about how do you what support do you take in that ministry in that sharing and being you know representing your your faith um, and yourselves in these public spaces that you go to and also anything that you'd like to um, touch upon that might have already been shared between you both um, Rachel um gosh uh just to, to answer Layla's question to me I'm I'm, I'm now in my 50s so I'm a child of the 70s um and um yeah transitioned gosh 30 years ago now um uh yeah so gosh uh I'm not quite sure where to go with this one in terms of of support um I think clearly I can talk about the the solidarity of community the solidarity of of the lgbt plus community i can talk about the solidarity of family and friends uh, i'm very fortunate although just saying that probably tells you just how bleak it can be for trans people i'm very fortunate that i have an enormously supportive family who um when i came out uh, very definitively as trans and began transitioning i wasn't thrown out I, I i remained part of of that family community and indeed it's been absolutely crucial for for my flourishing in all sorts of ways i i think we are creatures of community first and individual second I think we live in a very individualistic age but actually the older i become the more i rely on community and i think that's especially true as someone who i mean going back to those childhood teenage formative experiences the profound sense of loneliness i felt as a young trans child and the sheer terror of being found out for want of a better phrase the sheer terror of being known and the 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 endless routes that i took whenever i was given opportunities to articulate my story to avoid talking about that until i reached a point where it really was a case of it this is life or death this is a life or death decision and i need to say this is who i am and that loneliness remains a theme of me i mean those formative experiences i mean it's very difficult to walk away from an early formation where i have had, had this longing to be be a member of a community to have a sense of of place and belonging and often trying desperately to find ways of of showing that and performing that but also just feeling utterly trapped in in my own head to be able to say that i am a friend amongst friends part of a community really matters to me i think at a more theological level perhaps it's unsurprising or at least it seems less surprising to me now the older i become that when i I came to faith and I didn't come to faith until my mid twenties. I was 26. I haven't transitioned four years previously. It wasn't until I was 26 that I came to a full flowering faith. It seems unsurprising to me that I became a Christian in part because Christianity has these potent metaphors about the body about the household about family and controversial though it is to my um fellow uh shall we say abrahamic uh faith tradition people there is this bewildering bewilder, bewildering paradox at the heart of the christian faith which talks about 
trinity, the triune God, the one who is absolutely three but absolutely one and that in the very godhead there is community this community of father son holy spirit creator redeemer um sustainer mother daughter spirit you know that whatever however we want to, to sort of unpick that or unfold that that dance of community is at the heart of the faith tra tradition which has sustained me and troubled me and um, at times uh, made me want to just walk away but there is something really crucial about that that sense of indwelling of growing into the likeness of Christ the profound sustenance and the sort of the, the playfulness of the Godhead the the strangeness of Christ, Christ's femininity, as much as his, her masculinity, that it's, it's just huge. And I hope you can, or I can communicate that via Zoom, that it, this, is, this is a bodily thing for me, that my queer, anomalous, strange, difficult to categorize body finds her place in the body of Christ. And that's just so liberating, but sustaining for me as well. Thank you so much, Rachel. Leila. Thank you. Thank you. That was very, very touching and very beautiful. And I, I can relate to, to a lot of the points that you've mentioned. You said profound sense of loneliness. I, I felt exactly the same and, and also fear, precisely the same. Um, I also, for, for me, this has also always been very much connected to an issue of belonging. I never felt that I belonged. And it was connected to other issues as well. It was connected to being a child of, of, of immigrant background in a very, very, mainstream German small town you know so there were other issues as well it was not not just the gender issue but of course the the gender issue contributed a lot to that I I didn't feel that I could belong anywhere um, and then in in the Muslim sphere when I started to visit the mosque regularly as a teenager um, that also manifested very much in the, you know, because in our mainstream Muslim spaces, we have so much gender segregation. You have a male space, you have a female space. And, and I was supposed to go to the male space. And of course, I did not feel that I belonged there. And I didn't quite felt, I, I didn't feel that I belonged to the mosque. I also didn't feel that I belonged to mainstream German society. Um, it was a very troubling time i i did not i have to say my relationship with my family now is is quite good and i have i have a very good relationship with my parents now but when i came out as trans it was very difficult it it took quite a while um i yeah there were times when they 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 didn't speak to me um for more than a year when there was no contact um it, it was a very difficult time there was a lot of struggling um and of, of course that additionally makes you feel very lonely in this world and 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 yeah gives you the message that that you don't belong when your own own family your own parents basically uh desert you at a time when actually you would you would have needed help <laughs> that is that is I, I don't really have a grudge um about about that because I do understand that at that time and in the social context that we lived in, my, my parents just were very helpless as well. They just didn't know better. They didn't they they were afraid. They were actually very afraid as well. Um but I I I I, I still think that objectively it's a horrible thing that when a young person comes to their parents 
and comes out with an issue like that and and the reaction is not support but it's it's rejecting you it's it's terrifying it's horrible it's 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 it it crushes you because you naturally want help from the people who are closest to you but when they do the exact opposite that that damages you beyond repair um that was a very difficult time for me uh, I, I found solace in my faith, but as I said, I couldn't really find that peace in my mosque community. So it was, it became a very privatized faith for a while. It, it became very, um, very much based on my own readings, my own view of, of text. And, and there, I mean, of course, we don't, um, Muslims are very particular about not accepting the Trinity and not accepting the incarnation. I actually, I'm, I'm not so emotionally invested in that. I have to say that because I think it's all, it's a matter of perspectives. It's, it's how you view things basically. But um, I still think there is something in our tradition as well that relates a lot to what you said. And that is, the thing that has always been most important to me about Islam, that is this idea of divine unity, which manifests in the plurality of being. You know, everything, all the beauty that we see around us is a manifestation of, of God, is actually an incarnation in some sense of, of, the, of the names of God. We, would, we, we make that difference, you know, not the essence of God, but, but the names of God are in everything. They manifest in this diversity of creation, in this pl plurality, in all the prophets that, that God sent to so many people, so many nations, all the saints. And um, I, I always... I found support in that thought because that thought, that idea gave me an assurance that if, if there is so much plurality and diversity in this world, which is a manifestation of the names of God, then my kind of diversity also has to have a space there. That's also part of, of this diversity. You know, as, as, as the Quran says, we created so many colors in this world and color, the, the Arabic word used there is also a very metaphoric word. It refers to, to mentalities, it, refer, it can refer to identities as well. So it's, it's that all is a manifestation of the divine. I, I had that realization quite early in life and accepted it for myself and it helped me to really reconcile my identity with, with my faith but I couldn't find a community where I lived. As I said, at that time in Germany, in, when I was a teenager in the 90s, there was even in mainstream society, there was no discussion of trans issues. In the mosque, it was very clear, as I said, gender segregation. Um, uh, the message was that all these strange things, these gay, lesbian people in mainstream society, that is all Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, there's no place for that in Islam. So I, I couldn't find anything that helped me at that point. Um, so I did my own research and I... I came to discover at some point that there were in some Muslim societies traditional trends or third gender identities that had cultural acceptance. And um, I, I was quite young. I was 16 years old when I told myself, okay, I have to explore that. I, at that age, I didn't have the means to do that at all, but I had made the decision at that point that I would do that. And, um, and I did, I, when I was 20 years old, I, I went to India, lived there, later went to Pakistan, lived there. I lived in the third gender community in India and Pakistan, which very naturally understands itself as Muslim, sees no conflict with their faith, um, and, uh, and is also very, very closely connected to the Sufis, to, to the traditions of, of Muslim mysticism. And, I have to say nothing ever gave me as much support as that. The reality of a, of a living community, of a living sisterhood. The, you know, you, you can theorize these things as much as you want. 
in, in your mind. You can read as many books and you can have your own private theology as I already had, but you need this, you need this social reality, you need this um, this foundation that that and that is something that I keep telling people nowadays. Don't when you have issues with scripture, when you have issues with your faith, don't constantly circle around the theoretical things. The most important thing is find a community, find a loving community, find sisters, brothers, brother, siblings, and and and, and you, you need that you need that space of lived and practiced love and when you have that space then often the other things the theoretical musings they fall into space uh, into into place by themselves and um yeah again this is a message that i keep telling people and they that i i very much believe in thank you so much leila I love this idea, you know, both speaking to the importance of community and, you know, Rachel, you said community before individual. I love this idea of the triune of community. It's another way of seeing, you know, this manifest manifestation of, of the divine in the Trinity, but also not trans transcended, but imminent, like we can connect to it wherever we are. And Layla, this lived and practiced love, you know, that is the heart of, of, of true community. And I, and I want to kind of connect to this. So a way that I saw deepening in our voice was within, our, within ourselves, connecting to that, our authenticity, but then also that gives us the courage to um, speak out in our communities, to speak and find those connections that we're looking for and so connected to that could you you know share anything around um you've both found your communities um you you know you both have vibrant communities local or international and uh, if you could speak to something about the deepening within that community connection um rachel May I be naughty and suggest that Layla goes first this time, and then I can respond to, to is that all right? Thank you. That's, that's fine with me as well. Um, yeah, you know, one of the, one of the interesting things that uh, I, I, I realized when I went to India for the first time and lived in that community was actually that at some point I realized, oh, I don't care about my voice anymore. You know, because when you are in that environment of, of sisters um, where everybody has a voice that's a little bit odd for a woman, then suddenly it becomes insignificant. And also when it's in, in a cultural religious space where it's acknowledged that you are a part of God's creation, which is something that a lot of um south asian muslims traditionally believe very much it's changing now with all the global discourses and islamism coming in and 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 also uh, western discourses coming into uh, south asia but at that time 20 years ago it was still very natural that south asian muslims they didn't quite understand who these people were there was a distance a social distance towards these third gender communities but everybody was very clear okay this is just part of god's creation and then suddenly your voice is not an issue anymore um and also now as i said when i am moving in the world alone and maybe in a train compartment and drunk men come in that is a very specific situation you know but when i'm when i'm together with friends even here in in the west in germany or the uk and 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 uh, i spend time then i i f i forget about that issue because it doesn't matter anymore i feel safe i feel loved i i i'm surrounded by people whom i love and 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 suddenly i do not worry about these things anymore and 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 i even can sometimes become very bold and even be uh, loud in a way that i usually wouldn't be because i actually don't i I, I, I get this sense of, okay, let the world know who I am and what I am. I'm, I'm with people that I love and I'm with people who love me. So there's nothing to worry about. So I, I, I think community and 
practice love is very, very essential for that, you know, to experience that, to, to become free of that insecurity around your voice, whether it's the physical voice or whether it's the, you know, metaphorical voice in, in both cases, we need community and we need, we need practice love. Both we need to practice love, but we also need to experience the love of other people so that we can come to that voice. Gosh, I mean, I, you know, I, I was just thinking, Leila, I'm not sure I've ever quite experienced that sense of, of being absolutely relaxed in the company of, I mean, dare I say it, sort of fellow pilgrims and friends, really. Um, that's quite an extraordinary experience. Um, and that partly reflects, I suppose, some of the cultural, theological, social blockages which have been generated by the faith tradition to which I belong. Um, whilst I acknowledge, and I'm sure you would, that, well, you already have, that those who are third gender in Islam are not necessarily treated with the full embrace of the wider community, as it were, that there's still a it's that othering thing. One can be invested with a strange power uh, um, that um, uh, is not, that makes the wider community uncomfortable. Nonetheless, I've never quite had that experience. And that, it's interesting, I, I have that sense of, of, of absence and, and longing there, which is going to be something I, I will need to reflect on and pray about. In terms of responding, Simon, to your question I've made just sort of two quick notes and the first uh, the first point is captured in in a single phrase my voice is tiny or shallow my voice is shallow but deep in the company of others and I mean the best way I can explore that is I suppose by making myself a little bit vulnerable here about just what an egotist or how pretentious or pompous I actually am. I remember, gosh, this is 10 years since my debut book, Dazzling Darkness, came out. It was a, it's the only book I've ever thought I needed to write. It's a book of a spiritual memoir, a theological um, autobiography about being trans, Christian, about God and about my experience of chronic ill health. And I remember <laughs> when I was writing it and I, I showed some early drafts uh, of it to a friend who had been long, long in the world of feminist and, and queer thinking. She said, Rachel, you don't have to do it all yourself. Remember that there are so many people who've walked this path before you. And what she meant was not that there were so many people who reflected into that intersection of trans identity and faith identity. I think there were very few people who done that or done it well, but that we really are in the company of the othered, that there is something about finding those intersections, those, those points of promise, which are also points of pressure between the radically different, but also common experiences of those who have experienced othering. And that was a moment when I think I just began to discover another horizon of of community, that, that community of those who are in search of, of words for which there haven't been words. And, and that's the company of the various generations of, of feminists, the company of uh, those from global majority heritage backgrounds who, whose 
whose stories have been silenced, those who've experienced serial prejudice. And it's not about me daring to suggest in any way that I can claim that space, but more to say, in our company, in our solidarity, there is this extraordinary depth. And that any contribution that any single person can make will only make a little tiny pinprick on the surface of what could be said. So that's the first thing. The second thing is to do with voice and vocation in, in Latin, vocalis has the same root as vocare vocalis voice vocare vocation and that sense of being called vocation as call it requires being attentive to the voice to voice and voice which is divine and human which is particular and general, is of a time, but is also of all time. And of course, that's one way of talking about God, but I think it's also, I mean, to pick up Layla's point about you know, the 99 names of God being shown forth in all creation, um, the color, found in all life that we are talking also about human discourse responding to one another because god is shown forth in each and every one of us and in community and i think that there's that that depth of tradition, of history, of story, which again can be used in such utterly bleak ways. I mean, we see it at the moment with the sheer horror of Christian nationalism that seems to be gaining strength in, in the States, um, but is also present here in the UK. This sort of wanting to claim tradition and history and and all of those practices that go before in a way that actually crushes and oppresses will actually know in, in our great resources, in the great traditions, in the Quran as much as in the Bible or in any other sacred text, there is a seeking to tell forth a response to the call to add voice to vocation. Thank you so much, Rachel. I always find it very difficult to articulate my feelings <laughs> after you've spoken. But, uh, but thank you for also bringing that connection between, um, between the Latin roots. Um, before I uh, move on, I just wanted to um, put out if uh, Leila wishes to touch on anything that Rachel shared, please do um, feel free to kind of ju jump in at any point if you want to speak to anything that's been raised. Yeah, I, 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 I actually, I, first of all, also again, thank you from me that that was that was amazing. Um, and, and again, very, very touching. Um, I said that a couple of times already. It, it sounds so banal <laughs> to to repeat that, but it's really very heartfelt. Um, you you said the the the, com the company of the othered, and when you said that, when you were speaking about that, it reminded me of something that at at some some point in my career, and here I mean my spiritual development, I. I formulated at some point, um, I said, in, in the story of Lut, you know, the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah of, of, of Lut uh, in the Bible, um, we are not the people of Lut, we are not the people of Sodom, we are the angels in that story. This is a realization that I, I, I have had at some point. 
the story of Sodom and Gomorrah of, of Prophet Lut is thrown at us constantly, all queer people, all LGBTQI people who are of, of an Abrahamic faith tradition are constantly, you know, this story is thrown at us and, and, uh, and but, but if you, if you think of it, if you think of that anecdote that I told you about me being alone in that train and in the train compartment, being afraid of the violence of those men, in, in, in that story, who am I? Am I the people of Lut? Am I the people of Sodom and Gomorrah? No, I'm not, you know? Um, in the story of, of Lut, the, the angels are threatened with the violence of, of these men who want to rape them, who want to exploit them. And they, they say to, to Prophet Lud, get you know, please deliver your, you're not allowed to have these protected guests there. Deliver them to us so that we can do with them what we want to do with them. That is the fear that we as queer people constantly have and that all people who are othered constantly have. When you are othered, you, you are in that position of that fear. Um, but also just as the angels, you are also in a position where you, you actually make people ask questions. And those questions may not be very comfortable for us sometimes. Like, you know, when somebody asks, is that a man or is it a woman? But I, I, at some point in my life, I've come to that point where, where I've treated these, these experience as a moment of, well, where, where I could, I'm always hurt. I'm always very much suffering in those moments. It's always horrible. But, but afterwards, when I've gone through the process of healing, or at least healing a little bit from these experiences, there's always this moment where I think back to these people asking these questions. And I think, yeah, there was something to think about for you, you know, something to question about gender identities, about es essentializations, you know. And I, I, do, I do believe that we who are othered, not only LGBT people, but everybody who experiences this sense of being othered by society is also here in this world. So that, that other people can be confronted with that. And just as the people of Lut in that confrontation, they can decide whether they go in a good direction or in a bad direction. That is, it's, it's, it's a moment of spiritual significance. Um, and that's why I, I say this, in that story, we are not the people of Sodom. We, we are the angels in that story, actually. Wow, Leila, that is so, so beautiful and so profound. And what, a, what an amazing way. And yeah, vocalizing the truth, right? Another truth of that story. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I, I want to carry on. I, I also just want to kind of put up. So this is this is Layla's book. Um, I highly recommend everybody rush out and get this. It's absolutely amazing story. I learned so much. And again, just like you've just shared this verse from the Quran that many of us are, you know, are familiar with, getting another voice, another perspective on it. One of the things that really struck me in your book, and I mentioned this um, in the, uh, the interview that you had with Dr. Amna Wadud, uh, where she uh, spoke about your book as well. I was really struck by your, your such deep humility in not wanting to speak for others. You know, that you connect with this community in India and Pakistan, and you are sharing your experience but you're constantly at pains to, you know, make clear that you're not um, doing the thing that you, know, you, you mentioned it in your book as well. The thing that, you know, that people from the West, when they go to these, you know, exotic places, they try to speak for them. And you're constantly kind of clarifying that you're not doing that. And it, and it does really come through really beautifully. It's your experience. And I just wondered, you know, if you could share a bit more, how is that process for you that when you, when you may be there, you may be perceived of being the voice of the West. And then when you're here, 
you're speaking, you know, about your experiences and it could be this voice of the East. How do you balance these, um, these voices and these projections of voices from others upon you and your experiences as well? That's, that's sometimes a tough job, I have to admit. And it's, it's also a tough job in particular if you, if you are to, again, borrow uh, the, the phrase that Rachel has used, if you're a cre creature from another galaxy, you know? Um, when, when I've made these experiences, I mean, that, that started, as I said, 20 years ago, we, we have had no public discussion at all about, about subjects such as cultural appropriation. Um, the, uh, the discussion about uh, racism was still very underdeveloped and it was even more underdeveloped in Germany than it was in the UK. Um, we didn't we, we we didn't have any awareness of the of the complications of of privilege. I I I don't think twenty years ago anybody talked about privilege, um, in at least not in the way we do we do now. So I was just going there. I was having my experiences, and I also as I said, I always had this issue of belonging, and I had this pain and this fear and all these experiences from my childhood and my youth and. And of course, I thought, okay, I am an oppressed human being. I'm an oppressed trans woman. I'm, uh, and I'm just a Muslim going to visit other Muslims. And I, w I wasn't thinking of my privilege at that time either. I wasn't aware of it at all. Um, we're now at a quite different time in history, quite different point. Um, I, I'm not on board with all the directions that this discussion is going at the moment. You know, I mean, we all know that there are some difficulties and pitfalls with the identitarian uh, debates that we have in society. And it's sometimes going in directions that are not very helpful. But I do think that all in all, this conversation is very important because we haven't had it before. And, um, and it's, it's, it's been a journey for me as well to come into that kind of conversation, to, to think about my own privileges. This is not something that I was born with. And it was not something that I was raised with because as I said, my experience was mostly the experience of being a marginalized and oppressed person. Um, if you ask me, how, how do I do this? How do I manage this? It's, it's not that I can give you a recipe or some, you know, some magical trick. I can, I can just say it has something to do with, with developing a kind of personal integrity and being honest with yourself, also being honest about things that may be uncomfortable for you yourself. Um, and, and in the end, I always, I, I, and I say that, I constantly say that in, in the context, in, in, all, in all these debates that we have about racism, cultural appropriation, sexism, and so on and so on, all these very highly emotional debates that we have at the moment, I always say what it boils down to is decency and also very, very clear and simple values that we have in all of our religious traditions, you know, respecting the other human being, respecting the dignity of the other human being. Uh, the golden rule, treat others as you want to be treated. And that extends to all these issues as well, you know, racism, sexism, transphobia, when in, in all these contexts, cultural appropriation, when in all these contexts, we just develop this decency to, to respect the dignity of other human beings and to treat other human beings the way we want to be treated, then, then all these huge issues actually shouldn't exist. This is very, very fundamental thing about human ethics and, 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 and how we should exist as human beings in the world. And I can, I, I, I can just, Basically, what I would say is listen to the Bible, listen to the Quran, you know, and obviously we know there are people who do listen to the Bible and the Quran and who still get something else out of it. And um, but but I, 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 I do I do think I do think Jesus had said all that we need already and, and the Quran has said it all already. Um, it's not it doesn't, you know, 
it's not something magical about me that I'm capable of doing this. It is something that humankind has been taught for centuries and millennia again and again, and the messages are there and we just have to implement them in our lives. Thank you so much, Leila. And I just wanted to kind of just to continue on that as well. Uh, something else in your book that you said, and I wonder if you could explain it. You, know, you obviously will to explain it much more succinctly than I will. But I was really struck by this idea of, I'm almost seeing it like a, con a con connection to cultural appropriation, which is kind of this cultural rigidification, if that is even a word. Um, but um, I see it in connection to what you said, what you spoke about in the book about how the communities, you know, in India and Pakistan, they see themselves in one way, and they don't connect to the terms that the West have developed. And now there's this kind of idea that perhaps, you know, people that go from the West, you know, um, and bring the, the discourse around, you know, um, around gender and sexuality, and they're kind of imposing it without realizing that this has been part of the communities, you know, around the world since the dawn of time, and they have their own ways of connecting to it. And so there's almost like not honoring what has already existed, but kind of coming with your own idea and trying to impose it. Like, I just wonder if you could, you could speak to your experience of how you, you know, kind of spoke about it in your book. Yeah, even more so, even when, I mean, we don't even realize how, how contingent and what you call this, how, how relative in, in many ways our ideas about sexuality and gender are, you know, that they are, they, they are a specific formulation of these issues in, at a specific point in time in a specific society. They are not the truth about gender and neither is the way people in south asia like the community thinks about it the the truth um we constantly as human beings we constantly think about this we change our opinion you see that uh, rachel mentioned it um, that at, at at her time and uh, the same when i was young there was no non-binary identity, you know, there was no, I mean, as I said, there wasn't even much talk about trans people, but even thinking about something like non-binary or genderqueer or well, what have we now, no, it didn't exist. This comes now and, and a lot of young people find it much e easier, much more easy to identify with, with that than to say, I'm a trans woman or I'm a trans man. And, and that's also okay. But what we see is how difficult it is for people to accept that each generation may have its its new ideas and its new thinking about these issues and each culture may have its own ideas and its thinking about these issues it's a bit like it's it's like orthodoxy in religion you know it's like a dogma people cling to that and and think yeah we got it you know after 50,000 years of human cultural history i think it's roughly like the cave paintings is 50,000 years ago, we, we finally understood it. And the way we understand it has to be the way others have to understand it. The young people have to do the same. And if they don't, they are crazy and they are trans trenders and I don't know el what, what else they are. No, no, obviously not. There, there is no final truth about these things. As human beings, we are here to constantly discover, to constantly be creative and to constantly to constantly develop. That is how it should be. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm, I, I think that we're really lucky that we are getting so many diverse voices speaking, you know, to issues of uh, sexuality and gender from the East and the West. I just want to kind of big up Rafia Zakaria's book Against White, White Feminism, which, you know, it's a controversial title, but I recommend everyone read it. But it's again giving you know, for myself as a as a brown woman, you know, born and raised in the UK, wanting to now start connecting to my to my roots, but trying to take the the ideas that I have, you know, being in the West, and trying to connect them to something, and realize, oh, okay, I'm being really naive, you know, and um, and kind of really, I don't know what the word would be, like, oh yeah, but the West is best. Thinking, oh, actually, th this has been going on for a really long time, and again, every culture starts. I know has it at, at, at its heart. Um, Rachel, do you have anything to speak to that before I, I, I move on to another? Just to say, uh, gosh, 
uh, how <laughs> how much I have been tyrannized by what we might call boss girl white feminism. Um, I've just been apps and I tyrannized by it because it's become so much part of of my formational identity, um, but also sort of having a profound need to interrogate and question it. Um, that's that sense of, uh, particularly in the church, um, that really what feminism is about is about getting nice, competent, confident middle class women like me in top jobs. And then, then everything will be different. And and actually, that's such a thin exam, a, a, a thin, thin iteration of of feminism. There's. It's worth reminding. I'm reminding myself as much as reminding anyone else here, who has lived in the midst of that particular tyranny and at times has been advantaged by it but also been profoundly limited by it there is a reason why in the 1970s african american african asian global majority heritage theologians and thinkers started to say hey white feminist you do not speak for us or of us and began writing extraordinary things like sisters in the wilderness by dolores williams one of those absolute foundational texts in womanist thinking and it staggers me at one level that in so many parts of of uk scholarly but also i suppose wider middle class so-called educated contexts that there's only recently begun to be a reckoning with some of the toxic toxic hinterlands and underbellies of particular versions of of feminism including the third gen feminism, which has been absolutely crucial for my uh, identity. I'm thinking of, you know, the extraordinary works of, of people like Judith Butler. Um, I don't think it's, a, you know, it is, it is incredibly powerful. But to echo what Layla said, there, there should be no final words here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love that. No final words. Friends, I um, I blinked and I, I thought we had 50 minutes to go and I blinked and now we have 20 minutes to go. So that zoomed by. Please do um, feel free to share any questions that you may have for our contributors. You can put them in chat. You can also raise your hand if you're happy to um, come on screen. And um, so we'll allow some time for that. And as we uh, letting you ponder your your thoughts and questions. I also, I do this every year, Rachel, one of my favourite books, Dazzling Darkness. This is the uh, the, the revised edition. Um, I have uh, the previous edition, which is quite dog-eared and, and marked um, probably every other page is underlined. Um, so another perspective I want to give voice to is that of dealing so you, you know this is called dazzling darkness gender sexuality illness and god and i and I, I love that because just feel like kind of encapsulates a lot of our journeys um and i wonder if you could speak to this voicing of um the body and illness and the relationship with god like i have many many paragraphs underlined where <laughs> you speak to this and um and the connecting to the the dark god within in these difficulties of the body. Um, and I'm just gonna throw it out there for whichever, whatever you wish to voice around this. I'd always Gosh. appreciate hearing from you. Yes. Um, it's so, uh, I suppose for those of you who don't know me or anything about me, which I suspect is, is most, if not all of you, are uh, one of the, in some ways, the most defining theme of my life has not been being trans, it's being chronically ill. I have complex Crohn's disease. Um, I've had large sections of my 
bowel removed. And when I turned my camera off earlier, I was popping out to try and address the fact that my body is falling apart and use the loo, um, et cetera, et cetera. When I talk about the dark God, I think that's an example of, of me trying to speak into that place of promise and possibility that is found when one's body falls apart and one has to face, well, giving up all sorts of pictures about who you think you are and dark, why dark? Well, partly because darkness has so often been coded as negative and in a, a Western, white European dominated culture, darkness, bad, whiteness, light, good. And yet it seems to me that where I've most encountered God's delight, God's solidarity, God's love, reconciliation, compassion, grace is in the shadows and in the shade and in the darkness the darkness where the tomb associated with death is also the womb. And of course that's often been used, that metaphor, that binary has been used as a weapon, particularly against uh, women's bodies, cis women's bodies primarily, that somehow that power of creation, that fecundity, is also the sign of death. One is born into the world and therefore one dies. Yet for me, that's, that's just the most beautiful, powerful dynamic. What, and, and it's easy for me to say this right at the moment because my body's been reasonably stable in the past couple of years. But in one level, what actually is there to fear in death? really i mean how one dies that might be a matter for terror i suppose but we are all are dying all the time and there are so many deaths and without those deaths without the death of one particular iteration of me i i would not be here now without without the the, the death of of a huge section of my bowel, I would not be sat here now. And I don't mean that in a kind of, oh, isn't it great that I had all of that suffering and pain, but somehow, and somehow the pain is formative and isn't that beautiful? I mean, there's, gosh, that's, along that road lies all sorts of patriarchal horrors, but that somehow in the midst of that, there is this faithfulness of, of the divine and that in limit is all possibility. And that there's, there's still such, such beauty and that to be, I'm mean, Susan T Sontag, the, the theorist says that, that there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of the well and the kingdom of the sick. It's okay to go to the kingdom of the sick for short visits, but don't stay there too long because otherwise you will be treated with suspicion by those who inhabit the kingdom of the well of the of the the fit and healthy well the truth is is in the long run we are all citizens subjects dwellers in the kingdom of the sick and that's a wonderful thing to embrace because that's actually where we discover the facts of the body our contingency our particularity the the oddness of it. And that's where God dwells too. For me, I mean, Layla mentioned that word incarnation earlier. That very incarnatedness of God somehow is discovered in my fragility and my precariousness. 
And that precariousness is that place of invitation to love and reconciliation. The fact that we are all, everything is so precarious and fragile. It would take one crazy guy to press that button in the Kremlin or in the White House. It's, all, it's over. That is the holy moment to step into, into love and reconciliation. Not in a cheap way, but in the costly way where we just know the precariousness of it all. So I'm, I've, you shouldn't have asked me about this. I hadn't really thought this through. I'm rambling in that terrible, terrible way that I have. So, but it's about body. It's about our particular bodies, but it's about everybody. And that we're not made to be Greek gods. We're made to be these bodies in this time. And oh, isn't that, isn't that, it just makes my heart break with tears of sadness, but tears of joy too. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I always have to ask you this, Rachel, because when I read your book, you were voicing, you know, experiences that I hadn't been able to process. Um, and um, I would also highly recommend Rachel's session from last year, which we did specifically focus upon disability and spiritual spirituality with all the contributors. So that's on our YouTube channel. You can check that out. And we have a question um, here, Rachel, if you could repeat the title of Ruth's book. Um, what the, the, the womanist theology book, was it? Um, um, the one that you just mentioned about, um, Oh, about oh, sorry. Um, Oh, hold on, because there was Dolores Williams, Sisters in the Wilderness, the womanist theology, and then Susan Sontag, um, and I can't remember which book that's in, where she talks about the kingdom of the well and the kingdom of the sick, but I can find that Susan, out. Susan Sontag. Susan Sontag. Okay, I mean, she's, I she's that, terrific, I terrific writer, extraordinary writer. Oh, sorry, uh, Sophia's saying it's uh, Rachel's own, own book, so Dazzling Darkness. So you can find that on Rachel's website. I highly recommend to everybody. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, we have a question um, from Anna. Anna, I'm just going to uh, allow you to unmute. Oh, have you? Oh, here we go. Sorry. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Sima. And thank you so much, Leila and Rachel. It's been such a um, such a nourishing and expansive session. Um, my question is actually kind of almost maybe going back to the beginning about her voice and sort of the voice of the divine feminine. In both of your respective ministries or respective roles, you know, are there times that you feel that you are speaking for that voice, in that voice? Um, and if so, what is that experience like? I, thank you, Anna. I'm very briefly, um, gosh. I think the nearest I can can get to it. Uh, I mean, I, I, you've picked up. I'm a very passionate person. Right? Things that I care about, and I think actually I picked that up with Layla. I mean, gosh, Layla, I just just so extraordinary that your your descriptions of. I don't know. There's a sort of a steeliness that I don't think I've got, but maybe that's just me projecting onto you something that I want in myself. Um, and is absent, but the nearest I can get Anna to talking about her voice and and how that relates to her voice as a divine voice, and how in ministry, how on earth can I 
even begin to glimpse or, or, or whisper or find a word of that voice. It's, 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 it's at those points where I have no bravery whatsoever, which is almost every day, all day, every day. And I, I think there's something of the prophetic voice. Um, it's interesting in biblical terms, I guess almost all of the prophets are male, coded male. It's coded as this male voice. But there's also a riskiness in, in the prophetic voice that, which is both a calling back to who we were always called to be, but also an invitation to look at, at the possibility at the, at the dream, dreaming of dreams. I mean, think of, of, of Jeremiah in the Old Testament, the absurdity of Jeremiah buying this field in Jerusalem just at the point when Jerusalem is about to fall, the absurdity of, of having that level of trust. Um, I think that's the nearest I can get to it, but I, I just, I think maybe things are coming a little closer. I'm aligning a little bit with her divine voice. When I feel like I just want to die inside and I am shaking and I'm shaking and there I am and I'm sat in a meeting sometimes with very grand people and I have to do the poker face and say, well, you know, I've got to and do, do my sort of nice middle class voice. Well, that's absolutely right, Bishop or Archbishop, but then just speak into it. And that's, it's that, dare I say, sort of tingle moment, tingle of terror. Leila, would you like to speak to the same question? And I also just want to say that um, if there's anything that um, either of you would like to ask each other, uh, please also do feel free to do so. Yeah, um, I mean, it's well, that's a huge question, you know, and so that it, it would be a bit preposterous to say I'm speaking for the divine feminine, right? But I've already said that we are the angels in the story of Lude, which is as bad. Um, <laughs> I I don't mean this in a sense of you know like like some kind of narcissistic sense, but but I I, I do think that yes, we and it's in particular we who are so often othered by the world, we it, in just our own existence we carry that voice in some sense. It's it's there. And and then sometimes it really becomes yeah it it, it it's, Rachel what you just said is is precisely my experience and it's 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 so funny that a lot of people when they hear me speak um, in in public and in particular in you know like like what you call this like offline events it's a bit different with Zoom uh, because there are many disruptions anyways with Zoom but but. Um, when I'm speaking in, in front of an, an actual audience, I often get this feedback of, oh, and you're so calm and you're so rested and you're so, it's so wonderful the way you, you, you speak. And uh, the reality is that I'm, I'm usually shaking inside. I'm so, I'm so nervous before I'm starting to speak, but sometimes, and I did notice that it does, always happen when there's really something very important to be said in that moment of time sometimes it's I, I i keep telling people it's like i channel something i don't even i wouldn't even say it's it's me who is so such a wonderful speaker it's just it's something that happens to me that that there are these moments that that i step into something and and then it just happens and i'm just just grateful I, i'm very thankful that people perceive it as such and as such a message that i convey with with such uh strength but i'm also just very thankful towards the divine that that this happens to me i don't i i say these extraordinary things that 
sometimes have nothing to do with my own life really because i'm a complete mess you know i'm not i'm not you know i'm constantly struggling with spirituality with my own religion with religious practice with all kinds of things i'm struggling with my own darkness with my own shadows it's i've been depressed for the largest part of my life actually clinical depression uh, chronically fatigued there's so, such such a mess in my life and within me and 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 then I sit there and I say these inspiring things of which I can only say, oh, Leila, can you please also listen? You know, I should take my own lesson, basically. And uh, it got to come from somewhere. And yeah, I'm sure part of it comes from my own experience and my willingness also to be vulnerable. But I do genuinely believe that... Um, there's this thing in our religious tradition that, you know, in the Quran, it is said that when, when God says to Moses, go and go to Egypt and, 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 and you know, the let my people go message and he's afraid, he's afraid. Uh, but, but God says, I, I, I will loosen your tongue. I will take care of that. Don't worry about that, you know, and that, that is something that really happens. The divine takes care if we trust in it. It it does help us to find our voice and to speak. Thank you so much, Leila. Um, we are coming toward the end. I just wanted to just allow an opportunity if 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 either of you just wanted to um, have any closing. Closing reflections or sharings um, before we close for today. May I simply say, I mean, it's a great privilege to be here. I'm, I'm hoping that I'm going to have some time to drop in uh, to just be part of things tomorrow afternoon, particularly. It's been a great privilege for me, Layla, to, to speak in your company. I will hold with me that image of the angel uh, of the angels and and the way in which bi biblical, Quranic, religious texts can be used as weapons against those of us who actually occupy a little something of the space of the divine. So thank you. It's a great gift to me. Thank you as well from me. I'm so, I, I have to say, I mean, I've had wonderful conversations uh, in in the cause of these Ray Fest happening so far. You know, uh, we we've had wonderful panels, but this is I, I experience this conversation that we have here as such a blessing. It's such an incredible blessing, and um, I'm you know, and especially given that strange schedule mix up that I've had that I, I'm just now I'm so so thankful for this it's so beautiful to listen to you and to to speak to you it's it's wonderful and and thank you Saima thank you for everybody who organized this it's wonderful thank you thank you both so much yes I think the divine definitely had a plan there in uh, messing up uh, your your plans for tomorrow Leila that we were able to move you to today so it's been, yeah, absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, both of you.